morning. Good morning. Thank you. It's good to be seen and good to be back in us. And uh, is it true that when you say there will be food served, so everybody comes? So today's the luncheon, so that's a good thing. All right, let me begin. Um, our last time together, we read about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I wanted to read about what came next, according to the Gospel of Mark. And so it's just a very short portion. Here's what Mark wrote in the Gospel. Later he appeared to the eleven disciples as they were eating together. He rebuked them for their stubborn unbelief, because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. And then he told them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name, and they will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety, and if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick, and they will be healed. When the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then the disciples went everywhere and preached, and the Lord worked through them, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. These apostles spoke with authority, and the message they preached was affirmed by the signs that God brought through them. And I would say, today, we have God's message in our hands as a result of their obedience to our Lord. We have the Bible. What do you think? Are you glad we have the Bible in our hands today? Amen. We can point all the way back to the apostles who obeyed the instructions they received there. And that's why we have the Bible. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we give you glory, honor, and thanks today for our gathering. We give you thanks for being here with us. And we give you thanks for your word that we have to read and study and use as our guide, giving us direction as far as our daily practice. We have so much to be grateful for and thankful for. We're thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ and what he accomplished for our salvation. So today we just praise you and glorify you. And we say this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to turn to hymn number 415. And then don't stand right away because... You'll probably need a little refresher of the tune. It's a very familiar tune. We've sang this hymn before, but it's been a while. So I thought it would be good for Beth to play through the first verse so you can remember the tune. And then we'll sing it. So Beth's going to play through the first verse, hymn 415.
great beginning. Okay, so if you got your prayer list and you turn it over, we got some announcements. Starting in the very back, Daryl and Kate Eddy just had an anniversary. Yay. Friday! Am I right? <laughs> It was a great anniversary, wasn't it, Daryl? Yes. <laughs> I knew I could count on that response. So God bless you both. Thank you. Okay, and then as we said, there's the luncheon after the service, and it looks like everybody's doing their part, so there'll be plenty to eat. What a wonderful time we're going to have. And then next, um, the Israel story. We're going to start showing that next Sunday night. Um, I have a sign up for that on the baptistry table. Along with that, I have some information there that you sign up, take the information and read it. It lays out the foundation for the study. And now you might be wondering, what's the format? How many of you have ever been in Sunday school class with me? Raise your hand. How many of you have ever been on Wednesday at Bible study with me? Raise your hand. It's the same format. Okay, that's the format of it. What it's going to be the man on the screen will be teaching interactively. I will have handouts every Sunday night that we can participate with the study. And so I think you'll gain a lot from it. And it's a very good interactive type study. So I'd encourage you to really think about it. I only made about five handouts to look at back there because I didn't want to make 25 and have 19 still left, okay? So I only made five, but they're on the back. So on the baptistry table, if you decide you'd like to participate, make sure you put your name down because I don't want to make 25 handouts and throw out 24, okay? <laughs> I want to make exactly the amount of the people that are coming. So be sure and sign up if you're gonna come. And I'll have handouts for you that will make this study very, very informative and very, very enlightening, okay? So again, encourage you to think about coming. It will be worth your while to do that. Okay, on the baptistry table back here by the Kleenex. Everybody knows where the Kleenex is on the baptistry table? I know the people in the back row do. Right next to that are leftover daily breads. There are six of them. Now, if they remain there for the next three weeks, they're gonna be thrown in the trash. I don't think that's a good use of the resource. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is take some of those and give them out to friends or family or neighbors because that would be a good use of it. Okay, so there's six back there, and I want to see all six go on. I don't want to throw them in the trash. So that's a good way of using that material, okay? So please help me in that regard. Okay, a couple prayer requests I want to mention to you. One is from Wendy Atkins, and I have that information here. Let me share this with you. This came Wednesday. Greetings once again from Banda. These days have been a bit low key as I spend most of my time in my office. Almost everyone is out in the garden harvesting peanuts and weeding rice. Days go by and I see only Maria and the others who work for me. It's kind of nice since I'm planning my next trip, flights, visas, lodging, lesson plans, etc. Would appreciate prayers as I've been asked to teach on the book of Psalms at the Bible Institute in the Central African Republic when we go there in October. Please pray for flowing creative juices as I'm trying to develop two weeks of interactive lessons that will help the students not only learn the facts about the wonderful book, but also be personally impacted by the contents as well as the artistry. And then she has another edition. She says, just finished writing, recording, and mixing eight radio emissions on scripture and music. 
Please pray that the programs will encourage further development of God-honoring songs, as well as performance practices in the churches here. So there is a local radio station that sends out the scripture, and sometimes they ask her from time to time to contribute something. So that's another part of her ministry. And then if you turn over to your prayer list, number 18 on your prayer list, our missionary couple, David and Lily Johnson in Brazil. If you picked up their newsletter, you can read about it. But anyways, um, they learned that she was pregnant. And one week later, she had a miscarriage. So that's, you can see that on the prayer list. You can read about it there in their newsletter. So something we should pray for, for this young couple. So I think that's all the announcements I have, except for the offering for our guests last week, as you can see on the announcements, was a very generous offering. And he wanted to, for me to pass on to you that the money he received will pay for the visas for him and his wife in Uganda. So he sends along great thanks for your generosity. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful again for your kindness and your blessings on us. We thank, Lord, uh, again of those that we have association with. We think of Mac Bixby and his wife going to Uganda. And we're thankful that we were able to contribute to that ministry, enabling them to get the visas that they'll need in the country. So we give you the praise and glory and honor for that. And then we think of our missionaries, Lindy Atkins. We're thankful for her ministry there in Africa and all the things that you've enabled her to do. We think right now of this preparation for the teaching that she'll be doing there in October. We would pray that you will help her fully prepare for what she'll be sharing from the book of Psalms. And then we think of the Johnsons, David and Lily there in Brazil. And we would pray for them in this time of adjustment after coming through what was good news, and then a week later, uh, what happened afterwards. We would pray that you give comfort and strength to them as they continue to serve in your ministry there on the field. We give you glory, honor, and thanks for answering our prayers in Jesus' name. Okay, for our greeting hymn, we're gonna go to number 235. Number 235. And we're going to sing just verse 1 and 2, okay? Singing verses 1 and 2, and then we'll greet each other. All right, when you find your place, join me in standing.
Don't use that as an excuse to leave. <laughs> you're allowed to come, all right? Okay. Well, I imagine you can probably understand that I really enjoy visiting places I've never been before. That's kind of what I do. And I think of it as an adventure, going somewhere for exploration and discovery. And I've had many opportunities to travel our country, which has been a delight. And I find that the Bible is filled with the journeys of God's servants. And every one of these is a new journey, which we can explore as a spiritual adventure. So today, I would like for you to join me in a journey with Paul on the road to Thessalonica and beyond. And we're going to find that in the book of Acts. So let's go to Acts 15. Acts chapter 15. And we're going to take a trip. Acts chapter 15, verse 36. That's toward the end of the chapter. We're going to read from verse 36 right through to the end. Chapter 15, verse 41. Acts 15. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia, and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. This is the start of a second mission trip. But changes are in store, as we've just read. The team of Paul and Barnabas has separated. And it causes us to pause and wonder what might have been if they had stayed together. Paul has a new partner to accompany him on foot or by animal, and they're going to be going in the direction of north and then west. It will be about 250 miles over land to reach the location of the first mission trip. In a car, we can cover that distance in a day. But at this time, cars don't exist, so they will be on the road for many, many days. Let's continue. Chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman, who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. So the cities in this newly established frontier for the gospel were Derby, Lystra, and Iconium. A code of conduct for Gentile believers had been established by the apostles and other leaders in Jerusalem between the end of the first mission trip and the beginning of the second trip. And Paul participated in that meeting in Jerusalem. Now he is sharing this new information with the mission churches on the frontier. The response has been favorable and very encouraging. And these churches continue to grow spiritually and grow in number. This is really, really good news. And in this journey, we are introduced to Timothy, who's invited to join the team. 
his Jewish background is affirmed through getting circumcised. When this part of the journey is completed, they are motivated to find new locations to spread the gospel. Doesn't that sound exciting? New locations to spread the gospel. So how does this attempt to find new locations turn out for them? Well, we just have to continue reading. Let's go to verses 6 through 8. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were, notice the word, forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. So let me ask you, how do you think it's going in finding a new location? We would say it's not. It's not going as well as they expected. They were like, we can go here. They tried to go south, but the Holy Spirit said, not yet. Then they tried to go north. They got the same reply. So this caused them to do something we're familiar with. Go west, young men. That's what they did. They went west to the coast of the Asian Sea. And as you can imagine, there's a sea. Can't go farther west. They're at a dead end. They have traveled 650 miles in total from where they began their journey to get to that point. They can't go any further or can they? Let's find out. Let's pick up at verse 9 and go to verse 13. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. <coughs> and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Folks, Fasten your seatbelt. This was the initial journey into Europe with the good news. Did you hear me? This was the first step of the gospel into Europe. We know much later the good news would come from Europe to our country. Do you realize that? The gospel came from Europe to our land of America. So I would say this is a very important step for us. Now sometimes what looks like a closed door involving the previous attempts to go south and north may lead to a larger opportunity like this by trusting God's direction rather than our own. King Solomon wrote so long ago, and he said simply, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Isn't that good advice for all of us? At this time, in this reading, we're introduced to another individual simply by the use of the word we instead of they in the account. Who is the writer which makes himself part of this story? It's Luke. It's Luke, the Gentile doctor, who joins the team and remains with Paul for the remainder of Paul's life. The first great city in Macedonia is Philippi. 
a synagogue is the evidence of a Jewish presence. But in this city, there is no Jewish synagogue. Their efforts to evangelize start at a river outside of town where some try and gather to try and honor or worship God the best way they know how. Their work eventually lands Paul and Silas in jail, but a church is born. When they begin to travel again, their destination is to the capital of this province, only about 100 miles away. Let's pick up this story in verse 40. Chapter 16, let's move forward to verse 40. Let's read verse 40 and then chapter 17, verse 1. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now, this capital carries the designation of a free city in the Roman Empire. And I know you're, you're dying to know, what does that mean? That city had been granted the right to practice self-government without a Roman presence due to their loyalty. That's big. That's very big. That's big big. And this capital has two main avenues for trade. A Roman highway runs right down Main Street, and it has a port on the Asian Sea. The population at this time in the capital is 200,000. With a sizable Jewish presence among them, hence the synagogue. This is a very strategic location for planting a church. And that's certainly running across the mind of Paul and others. It's like, wow, we could do so much good here. So where to begin is the question in such a large city. Where do we start? Where do we begin? Let's look at verse 2 and 3. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. This was his common approach. Wherever he found a Jewish synagogue, that's where he would go. You see, he would be permitted to teach the truth in that synagogue. And he did it for three weeks. Wow, a guest speaker for three weeks. The Jews weren't the only ones in attendance for many Gentiles came here regularly also. So you've got a mixture, you've got a mixed audience, Jewish people, and Gentiles. What happened among those listening for three weeks? Let's find out. Let's look at verse 4. And some of them, notice, were persuaded. And that's talking about Jewish. And a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. So let's See how this broke down. Only some of the Jews believed, but not anywhere near a majority. The opposite was true of the Gentiles present. You see, they had turned away from their pagan backgrounds in search of truth for some time. Now, when they heard the truth about Jesus, there was no doubt in their thinking that this is what we need. Women of the highest status in the city joined the faith too, showing that the gospel reaches across all levels of society. You see, 
God has a way of bringing people together through faith in Christ that would never mix due to their social status in society. Listen to this comment made by Paul to those living in the first frontier of his mission trip. This is what he wrote to them. For now, we are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And we who have been baptized into union with Christ are enveloped by him. We are no longer Jews or Greeks or slaves or free men or even merely men or women. But we are all the same. We are Christians. We are one in Christ Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Are you glad for that truth of the gospel? That we're one? You know what that is telling us? Our backgrounds no longer matter in Christ. Is that good? I would say it is extremely good. Because backgrounds are usually what divide us. That's good news. Sadly, I have to report, it seems wherever the Jewish people congregate at this time, there will be opposition to the truth. Wherever the Jewish people are found, there will always seem to be opposition to the truth. And we might say, well, well, why? Why? Well, let's read on for the answer, starting at verse 5. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The Jewish unbelievers stirred up trouble by using others to incite violence. And then, and then what? They blamed the violence on those they opposed who were associated with Paul in the city. Does that sound familiar? It sounds very familiar. And the authorities feared their status with Rome could be affected negatively. So the local citizens that were believers now, that were rounded up here, listen to this. They were fined and they were forced to pay any damages which they didn't call. What does that remind you of? Don't answer out loud. Think about it. What does that remind you of? Here's Paul's answer. You know how many troubles I have had as a result of my preaching the good news. You know about all that was done to me while I was visiting in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. But the Lord delivered me. That was the first mission trip he ever took. Yes. And those who decide to please Christ Jesus by living godly lives will suffer at the hands of those who hate him. You see, injustice defined the ending of the life of Jesus. And this will be passed on to those who live for him like the people in Thessalonica. Of course, the situation affected Paul and his team very negatively. You might say, well, how did it affect them negatively? Let's continue at verse 10. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews 
These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Korea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. So, as we can see, what happened? Well, Paul and his team had to leave. They had to get away. Berea was, well, just down the road. How far? Only 40 or 50 miles. It's a lot closer than 100. The visit to this location was the most unique in the entire ministry of Paul. And we might say, well, how? The Jewish people here listened and then searched the scriptures to verify what they heard is true. And therefore it says, apart from any other place, many of the Jewish people believe the truth, along with many Gentiles, including those of the highest status in society. And the other thing that we find about Berea, there was no trouble caused here by the local citizens. This is very unique for Paul. Then where did the trouble came from? It came from outside the city involving the opposition traveling all the way from Thessalonica. So Paul, being the center of the controversy, departed, leaving his teammates behind to continue the work. And from Athens, he sent word for his two associates to join him after they finished what they were doing. Now, these two would join Paul not soon, but at a much, much later time. Let's go to chapter 18. And look at when they finally caught up. Chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens, and notice, went to Corinth. And yet, they're not with him. Let's go down to verse 5. Now notice what it says. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, they finally got there. Now, when Timothy came, he brought with him an update about those living in Thessalonica. An update. So, what did he report about them back in Thessalonica? Well, here's what Paul is writing back to the people, the believers in Thessalonica. He's writing back to them. Here's what he writes. And now Timothy has just returned and brings the welcome news that your faith and love are as strong as ever and that you remember our visit with joy and want to see us just as much as we want to see you. So we're greatly comforted, dear brothers, in all of our own crushing troubles and suffering. Notice here in Corinth. Now that we know you are standing true to the Lord, we can bear anything as long as we know that you remain strong. He's writing this, as you can guess and see, right from Corinth, only a short time after the two came. And this letter that he's penning to Thessalonica would only be preceded by one other letter in Paul's history of letter writing. It is one of the most earliest correspondence he has ever had. 
he included in this letter to them a very interesting instruction for everybody in that congregation to follow. Here's the instruction. Listen. I command you in the name of the Lord to read this letter to all the Christians. That's the command. Why do you think he gave this command? Something to think about. Everybody has to hear this letter. I think the answer is evident from another letter that he penned. Listen to this. But you must keep on believing the things you have been taught. You know they are true. For you know that you can trust those of us who have taught you. You know how, when you were a small child, you were taught the Holy Scriptures, and it is these that make you wise to accept God's salvation by trusting in Christ Jesus. The whole Bible was given to us by inspiration from God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and helps us do what is right. It is God's way of making us well prepared at every point, fully equipped to do good to everyone. God's word, as given through the apostles, folks, is essential to our faith and essential to our practice as followers of Jesus. This is what Paul intends for the young church just established in Thessalonica. They haven't been in the faith very long, and they are mostly Gentiles in need of instruction from God's Word. Let me just ask, how long have we been in the faith? Well, there's some of us here that have been in the faith 60, 70 years at least. There are others of us that have been in the faith, oh, only one or two years. <coughs> and many of us fall somewhere in between. <coughs> now, what problems have we encountered in our journey with the Lord? Is it anything like what these in Thessalonica have endured? I mean, you become a Christian, you become a target. That's the reality. Here's a sample of the trouble they lived with daily in Thessalonica. Here's a sample. Don't ever forget those wonderful days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you kept right on with the Lord, even though it meant terrible suffering? Sometimes you were laughed at and beaten. And sometimes you watched and sympathized with others suffering the same things. You suffered with those thrown into jail. And you were actually joyful when all you owned was taken from you. Knowing that better things were awaiting you in heaven. Things that would be yours forever. Wow. How do we overcome our troubles in living for Jesus, regardless of the severity of the trouble or the simplicity of it. Listen to this answer given in response. Do not let this happy trust in the Lord die away, no matter what happens. Did you hear that? No matter what happens, don't let your trust in the Lord die. Remember your reward. You need to keep on patiently doing God's will if you want him to do for you all that he has promised. His coming will not be delayed much longer. And those whose faith has made them good in God's sight 
must live trusting him in everything. Otherwise, if they shrink back, God will have no pleasure in them. But we have never turned our backs on God and sealed our faith. No, our faith in him assures our soul's salvation. Now, if I understand those instructions clearly, there's a lot said about faith. Faith in Jesus. Trust. Don't let trust die. So now i got to ask, well, what is faith? Here's the answer the Bible gives. It is the confident assurance that something we want is going to happen. That's faith. But not only that, it is the certainty that what we hope for is waiting for us, even though we cannot see it. close by saying let us press on in believing Jesus and living for him in spite of the trouble we encounter here on this earth for doing so. Amen? Amen. Let us press on. Let's pray. Father in heaven we come before you with very grateful hearts for the opportunity to believe in you, the opportunity to trust in you, and the opportunity to trust in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are so thankful to be reading about an account where the gospel came to Europe with the Apostle Paul and his team. And we know that gospel would spread throughout all of Europe and then finally we come to our shores here and now we have heard the truth and have had the opportunity to believe in you to believe on your son and to enter your kingdom oh, what a glorious privilege and benefit we have received and now we ask for your help to keep pressing on and believing and trusting daily in your son, never giving up that trust, and to live by faith, to live by faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you so much for what you promised us. We give you glory, honor, and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. For our closing hymn, we want to go to number 734. 734. We like this song very much for what we've studied. And so when you find your place, join me in standing and let's sing this number 734.
would pray a blessing on the meal downstairs, that would be appreciated. Is that all you want? A blessing on the meal downstairs? <laughs> and to pray for our dismissal. Lord, we come to you and thank you for the message that you have given to us today. Give us the courage and the strength, Lord, to take the message and continue to preach it to anybody who will listen. And we thank you and hope, Lord, that when they hear the scripture, they will ask you to give in their life to be the Lord and Savior. And we thank you for that. We also, Lord, ask you to be with Israel. Bless them, lift them up spiritually. Continue to be with them, but they also today may ask you to come into the life to be the Lord and Savior. We thank you for that. Bless America and touch me, Lord, and help us to take back America and give it back to you, Lord, that you may rule over us as the heart of God and be your children. And we thank you for that. One more thing, Lord, we ask that you bless the food about to partake of, come and enjoy it with us, and we thank you, Lord, for providing it for us. In your name, Jesus, amen. Thank you.